It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search it out is the glory of kings. This is the Message to Kings podcast. Episode 135, Pharaoh Shishak's Invasion of Judah and the Legacy of Rehoboam. Proverbs 14.34 Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. I've always loved this verse and speak of the righteousness of a people and a nation, but rarely cover the second part of the verse where sin condemns any people. In this episode, we have the perfect example of when the sins of the people of God condemn them. In fact, we have a case study of sinful behavior inviting judgment. And further, when the people actually ask for justice to be played out upon them, and the result is the rise of a foreign nation, the equivalent of the transfer of the wealth of the gold reserves to another nation and another golden age for Egypt. Something happens in Jerusalem. With Rehoboam, after those three good years or so he has, something clicks inside of him. And just like Solomon, but way quicker, Rehoboam flipped the switch and radically changes from a servant of good to a servant of evil. He truly appears to have partially repented after the encounter with the prophetic rebuke. But his heart change doesn't appear to be complete, or it was just half-hearted. There's a clue as to this radical shift away from God. 2 Chronicles 11.18 Rehoboam married Malahalaloth, who was the daughter of David's son Jeremoth, and Abihail, the daughter of Jesse's son Eliab. She bore him sons, Jeus, Shemiah, and Zaram. Then he married Mekah, daughter of Absalom, who bore him Abijah, Atai, Ziza, Shelamoth. Rehoboam loved Mekah, daughter of Absalom, more than any of his other wives and concubines. In all, he had 18 wives and 60 concubines, 28 sons and 60 daughters. Rehoboam appointed Abijah, son of Mekah, as crown prince among his brothers in order to make him king. He acted wisely, dispersing some of his sons throughout the districts of Judah and Benjamin into all the fortified cities. He gave them abundant provisions and took many wives for them. So all seems fine at this point, but there's a sign for us to see when his heart changes in the very near future. It's interesting, his favorite wife was the daughter of Absalom, who signifies this spirit of rebellion. I wish we had a timeline, but could it be when he married Absalom's daughter, it fell in line with the timing of his personal fall or agreement with rebellion against God? For Second Chronicles 12.1 reads the following. After Rehoboam's position as king was established and he had become strong, he and all Israel with him abandoned the law of the Lord. Like a spoiled kid, his few good years was not true enough and repentance not complete. He was afraid of the consequences of sin and judgment, but his heart changed to God was not fully complete. It's almost like pride and arrogance set in, and as all of Israel's restoration appeared to be within his grasp by sheer default alone, with the movement of people from the north to the south, he was on the verge of great success, but it was at this moment when he faltered. Here at the apex of his success, he failed to pray and love on God in the grips of generational sin, multiple wives, Soul ties combined with pride, rebellion, arrogance, and a lack of character led a disaster for Rehoboam. First Kings gives us way more detail than we really want to know, but here it is. First Kings 14.22 Judah did evil in the eyes of the Lord. By the sins they committed, they stirred up his jealous anger more than those who were before them had ever done. They also set up for themselves high places, sacred stones, and Asherah poles on every high hill and every spreading tree. There were even male shrine prostitutes in the land. The people engaged in all the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. 
All right, so we've got to park here because something horrible, horrible, horrible has just happened. It's a figure of speech in a way that they built high places on every hill and every spreading tree, but it's not. I mean, this is terrible. We're at the low of the original Canaanites, which received God's judgment minus the Nephilim thing. It's terrible. We're only two generations from the time of King David, the greatest king in Israel's history. Israel has sunk to new lows, and the heart of God must have been sad. Then there's the introduction of the male shrine prostitutes, and we sink to a level unseen. This is basically homosexual hedonism and religion put together. I can't explain this in detail, nor do I want to research it further for your sake and mine. This is an invitation for God's judgment, and that's where we are headed. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah in those days? The only way out at this point is atonement for sin and the mercy of God. Also take note of the high places. These were set up by Rehoboam, and unfortunately, many of the good kings will come later, and they will not go so far as to remove these high places. Unfortunately, these high places will quickly become part of the culture of Judah and seriously hamper its development spiritually as a people. So basically, Jeroboam sets up golden calves, which is terrible, but Rehoboam takes it to a new level and worships any and everything and defiles the land to the level of the Canaanites before them, in a time when Israel was already in the judgment of God, and most likely when authentic worship was ceasing, and the atonement for sins at the temple was decreasing, and sin was rising, and idol worship was taking over, the devil was given permission and legal access to kill, steal, and destroy. And it came not from the north in Jeroboam, but from the south. Most likely, Jeroboam had a role to play in what happens next, and I have reason to believe it was part of his plan and he was very involved. And as the buildup continues on the border between Israel and Judah, most likely Rehoboam continued to scare Jeroboam into making his relationship with Egypt more formal yet secretive, an alliance to destroy Judah. Most of this probably stemmed from Jeroboam's fears he would lose his new kingdom. So he faints an attack against Judah, which causes Rehoboam to place his ablest soldiers on the northern borders on high alert. And it is at this moment like a giant pincer movement. The Pharaoh of Egypt, with a load of other African nations, invades Judah from the south in the soft underbelly of Judah. If the biblical numbers are correct, this is the largest Egyptian army fielded in centuries. Second Chronicles 12.2 Because Judah had been unfaithful to the Lord, Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem in the fifth year of King Rehoboam with 1,200 chariots and 60,000 horsemen and the innumerable troops of the Libyans, Sukites, and Cushites that came with him from Egypt. He captured, he captured the fortified cities of Judah and came as far as Jerusalem. All right, at this point, Jerusalem is threatened with a huge army, and Rehoboam probably isn't prepared for the battle or a siege because most of his troops were probably on the northern borders. And they were terrified, and a prophet shows up. Second Chronicles 12, 5. Then the prophet Shimei came to Rehoboam and the leaders of Judah, who had assembled in Jerusalem for fear of Shishak. And he said to them, This is what the Lord says. You have abandoned me, therefore I now abandoned you to Shishak. The leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, The Lord is just. When the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, this word of the Lord came to Shimei. Since they have humbled themselves, I will not destroy them, but will soon give them deliverance. My wrath will not be poured out on Jerusalem through Shishak. They will, however, become subject to him, so that they may learn the difference between serving me and serving the kings of other lands. First of all, stupid response. These guys didn't seem to really know God. Their answer was, the Lord is just. True, but wrong context. In this case, you grab for mercy and grace. That's the God I would call upon. Regardless, they got what they asked for. Justice. Pharaoh attacks and breaks into Jerusalem. 1 Kings 14.26 he carried off the treasures of the temple of the Lord 
and the treasures of the royal palace. He took everything, including all the gold shields Solomon had made. So King Rehoboam made bronze shields to replace them and assigned these to the commanders of the guard on duty at the entrance of the royal palace. Whenever the king went to the Lord's temple, the guards bore the shields and afterward they returned them to the guard room. Oh my, all that David won and Solomon built was now in the hands of the enemy. Can you imagine the gleam in the eyes of Pharaoh when he walked into the palace and store cities of gold and treasure of Israel? It must have been staggering. I mean, take that scene at the end of the movie National Treasure and multiply it times 12. And, and that's Pharaoh Shishak standing there. And it was all his. Now, I do want to point out that Pharaoh Shishak didn't actually get everything. Um, the Ark of the Covenant was hidden away. For during the time of Josiah, it states, the Ark was placed back in the temple by the Levites who were in possession of it. So most likely, the Levites rushed the Ark of the Covenant out of the temple and hid it somewhere. Um, and, and it's probably going to make its way back in the temple, though the Bible doesn't mention it. Um, and the Levites are going to hide it again. Um, but there are, of course, many theories on the Ark of the Covenant. But this is probably what happened. It got hidden away, and it was placed back in the temple later. Other treasures and massive gold stocks and treasures upon treasures and gold upon gold bars stocked by Solomon were hauled away to Egypt. Egypt would emerge as a world power, again, at least for a season, for economically, Egypt would possess the equivalent of the world's economic superpower status and the world gold reserves, which would lead to a massive economic and military boom in Egypt. All right, so who was Pharaoh Shishak? Honestly, I don't know, and a lot of people have suggestions, and in fact, I feel like I'm going to go against some things I previously said in Judges and for the Egypt time period, but here we go, since no one really seems to know for sure. I've read some articles to get this clear, but they only make your head spin, because Egyptian chronology is just a mess. The candidates for Shishak are Sestoceros. Ramesses, Thutmose III, and there's others across the board. A few notable researchers, such as David Downs and John Ashton, have pointed to Thutmose III as the pharaoh, pointing to the botched standard Egyptian chronology that conflicts with the Bible and inscriptions of gold shields and doors taken as loot from the Jerusalem campaign on the temple at Karnak. So if we go with Thutmose III, Let's look at his reign and consider what happens next. He's termed the Napoleon of Egypt by some, and he fought battles even across the Euphrates River. According to his inscriptions on the walls at Karnak, he gained control over all of Canaan. This he did via conquest of Judah and an alliance with Jeroboam. And then he crossed the Euphrates and defeated many nations and received quote-unquote tribute from the Assyrians, Babylonians, and Hittite kingdoms. So a warrior pharaoh comes to power and just smashes all these little kingdoms that come into being after the dissolution of Solomon's kingdom. He moves into Canaan and takes the wealth away from the judge nation of Judah. Jeroboam's nation is rewarded as it allies itself with the pharaoh, but it appears he didn't get much back from the pharaoh, he didn't get extra territory. In fact, he probably just had to pay tribute at this point to Egypt. The cost of the alliance was security, but a draining of wealth and resources for Jeroboam. So here's an interesting thought I started the episode with. The sins of the people condemn it, but the sins of the people of God can lead to a rise of a nation whose purpose is the judgment of God. It's going to happen with the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and it's happened here. Egypt was empowered to be God's judgment against Judah. It's absolutely fascinating that we can date this temporary golden age in Egypt to the judgment of Israel. Now think with me. Egypt didn't do anything to receive this blessing. Israel did. 
but they lost the blessing and it went to another. And when considering what Egypt did to receive another golden age, the answer is really nothing. It didn't deserve the influx of wealth and influence, but it stole it from the hands of God's nation that turned from God and worshipped and defiled the land with their sin. From God's perspective, could God be saying, better the world than a people bent on being God's enemy, even if they are his people? Now our story continues. At this point, Jeroboam in the north is an ally to Egypt, and Judah would be considered a subjugated nation under Pharaoh. But this physical humbling finally leads to spiritual humbling. Second Chronicles 12.12 12. Because Rehoboam humbled himself, the Lord's anger turned from him, and he was not totally destroyed. Indeed, there was some good in Judah. King Rehoboam established himself firmly in Jerusalem and continued as king. He was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. After 17 years of Rehoboam's rule, he dies and his son Abijah takes over the kingdom, while aging Jeroboam continues to rule in the north. To conclude this episode of Message to Kings, we've got to discuss false repentance. Repentance is described as turning 180 degrees or changing one's mind in its entirety. It's really the concept of salvation, becoming a new creation. I was once a sinner, but now I'm a child of God. It's a transformation of a soul. It's being given a new heart and a new mind to walk and live for God. I truly believe according to the language Rehoboam repented and changed his ways, but we know it was short-lived. It's like he was repentant, but that was it. The Greek word sozo is used in the Bible so many times. It means saved, healed, and delivered. I believe he was repentant and possibly saved, but not healed and delivered. Thus his fall back to darkness. In the end, Rehoboam was given the kingship in a time of judgment. His faith was weak and his heart was not steadfast on God. And when he received the kingdom, it was on shaky ground. And with this shaky ground, it didn't take much to invite further enemies to invade Israel. So how does this happen? How can a person be repentant and fall back into darkness? There are many possibilities. Maybe his repentance was not authentic or not complete. In the case of Rehoboam, he had a period of grace to walk back to God, but it was casual, and he didn't take it serious enough. He felt God's power in the time of the prophet, but he didn't fear God away from the prophet and away from his word. His heart was not steadfast toward God, but on his own self and ways, and he didn't turn back to God. It required humbling and discipline, but it was the character of Rehoboam that was the problem. He didn't learn from his lessons, probably because he never was really raised to learn and he despised discipline. Many people learn God's ways and repent of their foolish and selfish hearts. Rehoboam did this, apparently, but quickly turned back to the other way. And unfortunately for Rehoboam, it required more humbling for him to come to God. It took foreign invasion and disaster and a daily reminder for him to come to grips with the power and supremacy of God. For every day Rehoboam saw the bronze shields, which represent judgment, every time he looked into his palace and was reminded of his past. It was unfortunate that this is what it took for a man like Rehoboam to truly understand God's authority, lordship, and power. Though Rehoboam was humbled and much of the idol worship was reduced, the high places remained in operation and constant inroads of darkness existed in Judah. May none of us ever be so foolish as to repent and turn back to God, yet later fall away into worse darkness. Jesus said if a house gets swept clean of an evil spirit, it leaves and returns with seven of his friends. And if it finds that the house is swept clean and emptied and ready to be occupied again, it comes in with seven of its new friends. 
but if it was occupied now by the Holy Spirit, it has no home. This was the problem with half-hearted repentance. A change in walk with God must be with a whole devoted heart. Half-hearted repentance can lead to greater troubles later. May we, as a people, be wholly devoted to God and worship Him. May our experience and encounter with Jesus lead to the full experience of salvation, of being saved, healed, and delivered, so that we may walk in the fullness of our salvation. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Message to Kings. Feel free to visit the website, message to kings.com, share the Facebook page, or if you want to chat, email us at message to kings at gmail.com.